As I understand, it's the title of this show <laughs> is uh, The Limits of Science, yes? <coughs> and I suspect, I don't know quite where you all sit, of course, there's a lot of you and there are many places God has many mansions for people to sit in. And I suppose you sit in very different places around the room. But I suspect that in you, since you are an SLM audience, you probably sit in general outside the limits of science and want to pull those limits in your direction or if they won't pull, kick them. <laughs> Uh, I, on the other hand, you see, sit inside the limits of science and try to push them out so that we meet in a common ambition to move those limits to include more and more, but our techniques for doing so are rather different. And what I want to discuss with you uh, what it looks like from the inside of science rather than what it looks like from the outside. Uh, we, you see, have our miracles inside, which are the miracles that we inside try to crack open. I have brought an example of one of them here. Uh, this is a plant. Uh, it's related rather dimly to the animals, but still no doubt related, no doubt alive, whatever that means. Uh, one would like to know what that means, by the way, you know. Um, a gentleman named Goethe, who also wrote a play which is much too long about a cad named Faust. Uh, <laughs> um, discovered, he was also a botanist, he was one of the most distinguished people that's ever lived, as both he and Leonardo <coughs> and two or three others. And one of the things he discovered was that the way this thing is put together is like this. That here is a piece coming off a piece like this. And that wherever pieces like this come off from pieces like this, you get a bud in the angle here, which is another piece like this. Uh, this means, and it has very curious effects on your entire vocabulary once you discover what's going on, uh, you see, when you were at school, you may remember what was called parsing sentences. In England we called it analyzing sentences. This is done by, well, Nora wouldn't quite be doing it yet, but eight-year-old, uh, what, ten-year-olds, twelve-year-olds? <coughs> uh, Jack hit Jill. Subject, Jack, object, Jill, verb, hit. Um, and what is a substantive or a noun? A substantive or a noun is the name of a person, place, or thing. And a verb is an action word. And so on, all that vocabulary. Which turns out, you see, to be complete nonsense. Uh, because what is characteristic of what is called a leaf, these flaps, is not that it is flat or green, though it happens to be flat and green in this case and to be the main feeding apparatus for the plant, but what is characteristic is a formal characteristic that it has stems coming from its angles, its angle. And what is the characteristic of a stem? It is that it has these leaves on it with stems coming from their angles. And what is the characteristic of a bud? 
It is if it comes from the angle of a leaf. And if you take a potato, a potato, you will see it has on it what are called eyes. And an eye is a little sort of pit hole on the outside of the potato. And on the rim of that hole, on the edge of that hole, you will see a little bit scale sticking out. And if you wait long enough, you will see coming out from the bottom of that hole that is coming out from the angle of that scale a bud which will make a new plant and if you plant the potato that will that new plant will make other potatoes underground etc etc and if you track the potato back the the stick on which the potato is growing because it's on the sort of string a sort of ropey stick like this you will find that this is not a root, but that it comes from an angle of what was once a leaf on the potato. And indeed, that whole underground thing is a stem which has little leaves on it, those scales, it has swollen, it is swollen, the stem itself is swollen, and what you eat is in fact stem and not root roots don't have leaves, and so on. Right. Uh, here's a nice one. When it was younger, each of these uh, sprays of flowers was twisted around like that in a spiral. And it was twisted <coughs> by a rather curious, interesting development of this thing of Goethe's. The idea is this. A stem <coughs> with a flower on the top of it. A leaf a bract, as they call it, with a flower on the top of it a leaf, a stem, with a flower on the top of it, a leaf, a stem, <coughs> with a flower on the top of it, a spiral. Mm -hmm. So that you see, um, this is the main stem, which bore this leaf, this is a branch, which bore this leaf, and ended in that flower. No, well, this is a main stem. This is this continues through there. This comes then from that angle to be a branch on that branch, and this is a branch on that branch, and so on, going around and around. Um, you will see this very clearly if you look at that. Forget me not. With a little tight little spiral, which is in itself a pretty thing. No. The miracle, you see, is that this very abstract idea, we are talking about something quite non-material, can last through the millions of years of evolution and recur, certainly all through the flowering plants, and I suppose the ferns, but I'm not quite sure about the ferns. I've never pulled a fern to pieces to see how it goes. I suspect it goes the same sort of way. It's not true, I have pulled a fern to pieces and it didn't quite go the same way. But anyway, from the flowering plants. And with a little trouble, you can dissect a cactus and find what the spines of a cactus are. And some of them are going to be leaves, and some are going to be the buds from the axils <coughs> of those leaves, and so on. 
and this big uh, thing we have around here, the uh, cricket pair, which makes these big sort of lumpy flat pieces at angles to each other, you know how they are. Uh, those pieces, those flat pieces which are green and juicy and do the photosynthesis for the plant are in fact stems, not leaves. They are stems which bear leaves, etc., etc. So that we've got this funny idea of a pattern running through the biological world under the more superficial details of how it works out. And if you had been very bright when you were 11 years old and your teacher told you that a noun was the name of a person, place or thing and that go is a verb, you would have put your hand up because every pupil really wants to make teacher blush <laughs> and said that if you say that go is a verb that doesn't make sense because evidently go is the subject of that sentence. Well, go is a verb and at least in that sentence go would seem to be a substantive and wouldn't it be nicer if we always define nouns to substantives and things by the pattern relations rather than by the um, content. If a leaf is a thing which has a bud in its axle, and a noun is a thing with a certain relationship to a verb, which has a certain relationship to object, to etc., etc., indeed to a, to a subject. So that you've got the same folding in of definition in language that you have in comparative anatomy of plants and, of course, in the comparative anatomy of you. And if you want to assert what is a nose, well, a nose is a thing between two eyes and rather north of a mouth, <laughs> you know. And that's how you know that an elephant's trunk is a nose and not a hand that got stuck in the middle of its face. <laughs> um, hmm? And, and that's how anatomy works, whether it be plants or animals, it doesn't matter. Just plants are easier to pick. Um, right. Now, the sort of magic that I'm interested in, the sort of margins of science that I'm interested in, are how in hell it can be that this sort of thing happens. And traditionally, science skips. Sure, from about 1800 onwards, increasingly after the publication of The Origin of Species, all good biologists have reverenced what are called, what were called homology, <coughs> homologies. Homologies are these formal resemblances between critters, be it plants or animals. And they reverenced homologies because homologies were evidence of ev evolutionary relationship. That anything which shows this sort of pattern belongs with the flowering plants and does not belong with the fungi or the liverworts that don't show these patterns. And you make your trees of evolutionary descent by this sort of comparison. And those that can, can fit most formal patterns are closest related together, and those which only share formal patterns dimly and abstractly are more distantly related and so on. 
so that what happened was that zoologists and botanists got very interested in these formal patterns but only to use them for the purpose of demonstrating relationship. And as far as I can make out, they never stopped to say, well, now it's very curious that this should be so. They accepted that it was so, used it to demonstrate relationship, and did not really say how strange. Now, you see, I've presented you with something rather odd because what I've presented is the idea that the formal patterns of language, the relations of substantives, verbs, etc., etc., are to be thought of in the same breath, as you think in your breath, with <laughs> the formal patterns of comparative anatomy and no doubt comparative physiology and whatnot. And the world is a much bigger and more ordered and I think prettier world than what your school teachers presented to you. And you might be quite content you know, to settle with a world that had that sort of prettiness in many ways. It would be very nice. However, it gets much more pretty as you get more complicated. I guess more pretty. Yeah. Um, because what I've said, to spell it out another step, is that all communicational systems, and obviously there was communication needed to control the growth of this thing, it had to say, this is the place for birds. And the cells in that place had to somehow receive information. We, 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 we are this sort in this place, and we do this. Uh, there has to be communication for a pattern to generate itself and go on growing and performing. And for that communication to be, for that pattern to be, you need communication. And to have communication, which is the other side of the picture, by means of language or by means of whatever, you obviously have to have pattern. It goes both ways. Without grammar, you cannot have language. Without the pieces of language, having their meaning because they are contextually placed in relation to other pieces in certain ways, the, the thing becomes gibberish and not language at all. Whereas if you watch uh, the behavior of a cat, for example, you will find that the noises it makes and its communicative movements and so on are all contextually shaped and if you want to understand what a cat is doing and saying, you have to imagine and empathize, feel with the cat, what its setting is, what its context is, from moment to moment. And you've got the same business that a cat, cat's kinesics, it doesn't have these accursed little chips called words, to arrange in patterns. It has movements and meaningful things and it will do this and make sense of them. Uh, it's a trick because you have to remember, you know, that you are an important part of the context that the cat is within. And you've got to identify where you are related to the cat from the cat's point of view in order to know what in hell is happening. Uh, in general, you see, what animals talk about is the matter that I'm talking about. They talk about it in somewhat less abstract terms, but this is what they're at. And they spend their time 
with each other and with you talking about the relationship which they are in with you and if you come home from work at five o'clock and the cat comes to meet you and says what cats say uh, you will remember that you've been out for eight hours or longer uh, that this is a time when mama cats would obviously feed baby cats and if you listen to the noise the cat makes you will find that it is not a noise that any cat would ever make to another cat that is adult cats don't make this noise to each other baby cats make this noise to grown-up cats and what cat is saying is mama she is establishing a context with you you see in which you are supposed to behave in a certain way which will involve a trip to the icebox <laughs> <laughs> but there is no word in cat for icebox <laughs> what there is is a word for the sort of relationship in which the cat assumes it is and which it asserts you ought to be the other end of <laughs> <laughs> And this is a very large part of what goes on between animals and I regret to say a very large part of what goes on between human beings that they may think they're talking you know about the formal patterns of communication or the relative to theory or all sorts of things of that kind but in fact what they are talking about is their relationship to the people they're talking to and here I am sitting in a chair talking to you establishing relationship and that's what I'm doing now I'm doing it you know very subtly and slyly by pretending to be talking about animals or plants or something but really I'm maintaining a particular sort of teaching relationship. You know, it would be a different sort of teaching relationship if I was standing to the blackboard. Uh, it would be different if uh, uh, you were 10 years younger. It would be rather different if I were 20 years younger, maybe. There's room for that. Uh, but you know one way or another we're playing with relationship which is a quite miraculous sort of business <coughs> and I better I think quickly resolve some of that aspect of what we're saying uh, you see I'm uh, by birth not an American but an Englishman of what in England we might call the professional classes that is I'm one of those people whose family did indeed and if they hadn't had enough money they would have been very sad about it they would have thought they were failing send me to a, a sequence of British boarding schools very probably the most elaborate initiation ceremony that's yet been devised by the human species <laughs> um, to make me into the sort of person that could go out to India and be an official within the British Raj or conceive a clergyman which I would have enjoyed of course um, or remember the professional classes um, now this was a very strange system to you fellows which again I said before in this land, that the English system leaves us with something called parents and something called children this is part of the 
presuppositions of relationship and the parents have some degree of dominance or are expected to act as if they had and the children are expected to act as if they had some degree of submission, obedience or something. If they don't go through some of that, the neighbors make remarks, you know, <laughs> and they will do that here too. And the parents are supposed to be succoring, that is providing food, medicine, <coughs> care, shelter, and the children are supposed to be dependent, supposed to behave as if, as if weak in response to this helping strength, this being controlling strength, okay? And the children are supposed to be, to watch, to be spectator, to something which we might call exhibitionism in the parents. <laughs> <laughs> On the other hand, you see in this country, to draw the same diagram, you get dominance and submission, you get suckering and dependency. But who is the exhibitionist? <laughs> and the parents are supposed to applaud, yes? Look, mommy, how I can jump off the sofa. <laughs> there. All very shocking. Are you still shocked by this in America? Not hmm? <laughs> <laughs> um, many Europeans go on being shocked by this for many years. Uh, well, that is. Now, you see, that means that now that I'm grown up and put away childish things, I still assume that if you put me up in an exhibitionistic role to sit on a chair while you sit on the long cushions and to talk to you about something or other, while you listen, you know, so appreciatively, uh, I must surely be in this position <laughs> and be in a parental role vis-a-vis -vis you fellows. I'm not in the position of the cat that says meow to put you in a parental role. I'm in the parental role to put you in the filial childhood role. And this sort of makes a difference. Uh, sometimes Americans misunderstand what the English are doing and think when they hear in the background of this talk a bid for dominance and suffering that uh, we're going to colonize America again. <laughs> Uh, but you've got to remember that the same thing goes the other way, in a very funny way. That if um, you go as Americans to lecture in England, and the English put you in this exhibitionistic position on a podium or chair or something, you will respond by a sort of exhibitionism which will make the hair of the English stand on end because they will assume that this is the exhibitionism of somebody who intends to colonize Britain. <laughs> you see. Because they put ex exhibitionism as a sign of dominance, etc., etc. So, never the twain shall meet. Except perhaps we can, uh, in this room on a small scale, enjoy the misunderstanding. 
that takes some practice. It's really what anthropology is about, is enjoying this understanding of the cross-cultural, cultural shock. Okay. <coughs> now that's all understandable in a sort of way, you know. I've explained it and described it to you. And you can go and you can get examples and you, you know, or you can look at other plants and find more or less these relations. Uh, there's some plants that cheat a little bit and take shortcuts with their anatomy. But on the whole, you can, you know, check this out. But the mystery still remains behind there of how in hell these regularities are produced and maintained. And that's the, the conjuring trick. Right, now let me sort of uh, hang that one up on a peg as something that's been said and we can refer back to it. And go on to something else. We used to call this a gamekeeper's larder. Uh, do uh, rangers and gamekeepers, people who look after wild territory, they shoot predators and so on. In England, when the gamekeeper shoots weasels and stoats and other small predators, he hangs the corpses on the door of his house mm -hmm. where they remain for years to warn other predators, supposedly. And this is called a gamekeeper's larder. And I want to hang up that piece of uh, hands uh, with a note that it applies both to such patterns as these things and to the patterns of relationship and to the cat putting you in a parental role. Uh, by the way, if you get in water and swim with a porpoise, you will find things are not at all the way you expected. You're in the filial role and not the parental role which you expect with pets and, and other captive beasts, like children. Um, all right, we hang that one up. And now <coughs> let me open up a new piece of talk. If you have two eyes, and you use both of them simultaneously, as you cranium allows you to do, I mean cows you know look out in opposite directions and can't really focus on the same thing with two eyes, not really well, they have some overlap here in the middle, but we have a very large overlap, mm, thank you, and are able to achieve what is called binocular vision. Uh, that is, I can see <coughs> Christina as somehow sticking out away from the wall behind her there, 10 or 12 feet behind. This is a very curious fact. And it means I don't want to go into all the evidence for this, but it means that I put together two images, actually four images, uh, because uh, my retina is divided with a invisible vertical line approximately in the middle and the information, the nerve ending from the outside of this retina goes to this half of the brain and the nerve endings from the inner side of this retina 
go in, cross over and come to this side of the brain. So that the two images over that from the, coming in from that direction are collected here and the two images coming in from that direction are collected here. And the whole thing is then put together so that the joint image appears to be an image in depth <coughs> and the join between the two halves of the two of the right, right and the left vertical split is totally non-perceptible in ordinary healthy vision. There are pathologies in which it becomes a great nuisance. But probably nobody here has ever really seen that join or had the effects of it. A curious business. Obviously a, a monstrous achievement on the part of evolution to make this beautiful machine by which we perceive in death. Uh, what I want you to notice is that by having two sources of information, we are able to get another dimension of information. A dimension, I'm using the word in a very technical and scrupulous way to get a, what is technically called another logical type of information by the overlap comparison techniques of two visual fields. <laughs> if one gives you that and the other one gives you that, here is our overlap. And the fact of that overlap becomes a base from which we can jump forward to another sort of information. Very clever. Now, leaving that one hanging in the gamekeeper's larder <laughs> for the moment, I want you to understand again what I'm at. Uh, I'm at looking for those things in the biological world mainly for which it is necessary to postulate mind in some sense in order to make explanations. And that is, it begins to look as though there is a world of explanation which we might call 19th century physics in which billiard balls bump each other and in which the energy of billiard ball A is somehow transmitted to the billiard ball B and billiard ball B moves in a response which is a purely physical response and not a mental response. Whereas if I kick a dog, you know, unless I kick him hard enough to put him into Newtonian orbit, <laughs> uh, what I get is a, is a mental response from the dog, a, do a response which is mediated by mind and in which he may indeed turn and bite me instead of moving at an appropriate angle <laughs> away from where my foot hit him. Uh, you know, this is, can be very serious. The dogs is all right, but bears, that's serious. <laughs> Um, they establish relationship <coughs> and it may not be parental. <laughs> um, all right. So that what I 
am committed to doing, if once I say there is a world of explanation where the energy of response is provided by the respondent instead of being provided by the kick stimulator uh, then I have to work out more or less the margin of which sort of explanation I'm going to use when where that limit is going to be and asking about that limit uh, begins to be, you see, beyond the limits that science really approves of. Now, the science wants to be a modest uh, structure, not a dualist structure. And I suppose, on the whole, in a way, many religions <coughs> want to be monistic too. Indeed, science, of course, is a religion. Perhaps rather a lame one, but it's still a religion. Uh, now, the moment you split, and you say that something other comes in, either as a creator or or as a sorter, <coughs> a sort of Maxwell's demon, or something, to provide you with miracles, you are in a dualistic world. And this is much more serious. Uh, my problem is to try to make a monistic world cover <coughs> as wide a field as possible. So my job is to draw the limits for where I'm going to invoke mind as a explanatory principle and if possible to draw those limits in such a way that they do not split the universe dualistically to separate mind from you know, the billiard balls and all the rest of it. Not to mention those beastly electrons and things who behave quite unpredictably, as far as I can make out, but that may be the fault of the physicists. So, it looks something like this, that I will use the word mind as an explanatory device if and when one, the system that I'm talking about is made of parts not themselves mental. That is, we are dealing with organization, with patterns of interaction, and a single part doesn't have any chance to interact with anything. And you have to have multiple parts to get anything. Uh, this cuts out almost of what people like Teilhard de Chardin want to say, for example. They want to say that every atomy at the smallest level is somehow endowed with rudimentary mental gifts, so on. And you get beyond what I can except within the limits of science as I handle it. So, the next thing is this matter of energy. That in the world that I'm talking about, to invoke mind as an explanatory principle, I shall expect the energy to be provided in general by the respondent rather than by the stimulator.
Uh, this, you see, will go for oh, the whole matter of neurophysiology. The fact of one neuron firing another. The second one, of course, responds from the metabolism, using the energy of its metabolism. Or if you think of a nerve impulse traveling along an axon, each <coughs> increment of travel is energized at the place which is producing the impulse all the time and the energy was there in front of the travel all the time in a potential form a chemical potential energy of some kind uh, that would be say criterion number two uh, criterion number three is that the pieces touch each other off by virtue of difference. That is, you see the, the billiard balls touch each other off by forces and impacts and such things. The cats and dogs and people touch each other off by virtue of that which can enter sense organs. And that which can enter sense organs is only difference. As far as I know, quantity doesn't enter. Uh, differences in quantity are what enter. And what we have to do in order to perceive anything is to make it into an event in time. This is very important. Every time I talk to a new audience, I do this silly trick. I make a dot on the blackboard and point out that if I drop my finger directly on it, I cannot feel it. If I go laterally, I can just, that's a very thin one I made that time. I can just feel it, actually. Uh, that is, we scan, and by scanning are able to make that which is static in the physical universe, supposing there be such a thing, uh, we make it into an event in time so that the, the graph would look uh, uh, so sort of step function of some kind. And whether we can perceive those differences depends on various sorts of mathematical relations which we can go into, which were discovered by a gentleman named Fechner. No, they were discovered by a gentleman named Weber. And Fechner, who was a friend of Weber's in Heidelberg in the 1830s or so, suddenly saw that this was a dreadfully important statement. This was heavy. And was the basis, as Fechner saw it, for a split between the mind and the body. But the fact that the sense organ perceived difference, and the differences which it perceived were not subtractive, they were not material, they were ratios. <coughs> A ratio having no dimensions, after all. It's a ratio between two similars having no dimensions. And on the basis of this, he I think went a little mad, probably. He had an idea, at least a hundred years before it was right for people to have that idea. And he worked out a whole theory of survival after death on the basis that the mind lives in a world of difference and not in a world of quantities. Logarithm, logarithms of difference, really. And the word logarithm somehow provided him with a split between what my mind lives on and what billiard balls live on. Uh, so we have, it's made of multiple parts, uh, the energy relations are of a certain sort, the thing is triggered by differences, 
and it is organized in circuits feedback circuits of one kind or another which gives a simulation the possibility of purpose and gives various sorts of inversion of time because if you are a thermostat for example or a steam engine with a governor very crude sort of diagrams paradigms parables uh, that which is happening at any moment in the circuit of a steam engine with a governor you know the faster this flywheel goes the more the arms of the governor diverge that's sort of rods with lead on the end maybe this angle is then increased in the governor and that angle is used to control fuel supply whatever it is so that you get a total circuit which may be a vicious circuit if you have it the more the arms are swung out the more the fuel is provided and she will then go into an exponential scream which engineers don't approve of uh, or you can uh, you know, have it so that the angle, angle is, has an opposite control over the fuel and you then if you're lucky may get a, what's called a steady state as in corrective to a certain rate of operation I think you, probably enough has been said about circuits, such circuits, so let's not go into that too much, I'm, I'm bored with them. Uh, but there is one thing more which is characteristic for mind, uh, which is that the patterns which was the matter I came in with these patterns of the hawkweed, is that a hawkweed? What do they call that in this country, that big composite plant? Oh, poison lettuce or Sanchez. Call it what? Sanchez. Sanchez. Okay. Is it good? No, no, it's, it's toxic. You can use it to make little warts go there. I consider that very virtuous. <laughs> 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 Uh, you've got to remember that all medicines are poisonous, really. But what we use for medicines are the substances which plants use to defend themselves against predators. Uh, it doesn't always work. The stink, for example, of um, chrysanthemum leaves, you know, they have a sort of resinous aromatic stink. We crush them a little bit. That is the stink of a substance called pyrethrum, which was the principal insecticide before the invention of these substituted hydrocarbons, which everybody now uses to poison each other with. Um, when I went to New Guinea first in the 20s, I carried a can of pyrethrum, which I mixed with kerosene to make a sort of flit and it killed mosquitoes all right and the pyrethrum is the chrysanthemum's idea of how to defend itself against predators that will eat would otherwise eat chrysanthemum leaves unfortunately the insects which eat chrysanthemum leaves now have enzymes which will destroy pyrethrum they keep these of course in their saliva and everything is well except that some of the composites that carry pyrethrum now carry enzymes which will delay the action of the enzymes which would destroy the pyrethrum and you get a sort of armaments race <laughs> <laughs> which I may say is very characteristic of all the things I'm talking about and human relations notoriously get into such escalating systems which may be equilibrated in all sorts of ways to make sorts of ecosystems 
Okay, we're beginning to get now a sort of picture of the circumstances under which I'm willing to be rude to my colleagues and say to deal with these sorts of phenomena it would be a good idea if you invoked the properties of systems of this kind which I propose to call mental systems. Uh, they very easily go into escalation, into various sorts of competitive runaways, but they may go in also into various sorts of equilibria and make creatures or communities of creatures even which can sort of balance themselves and go on and become what are called ecosystems. And ecosystems do not depend upon the sort of balance in which you would, you know, support a thing on two sides or set it up on end to balance. They depend upon balances which are self-corrective. So the moment that which is balanced goes off to the side of it, something comes in to put it up straight or put it up straight. And <coughs> it then becomes an object. Uh, uh, the business of the naturalist to take a good look at the system and decide how in fact it works. In Bali, there's a little illusion on this played on this game. You have little girls, eight, nine, ten, Nora-sized little girls, who are trained to dance in a trance state, in a, whatever that means. Because it will tell you more about that than I can. Um, Stan. And in this state, they dance on the shoulders of adult men, standing on the two shoulders with one foot on each shoulder and doing that with their arms, what is necessary for dancing, and wiggling their bodies around and doing a dance which any sensible little girl would do on the ground. Uh, they don't fall off. But you will sometimes see them take the supporting man out into the paddy fields. Because the controlling correction whereby the balance is maintained is not done by the little girl. It is done by the man under the little girl. And when the little girl slopes out that way, the man quickly moves in that direction. <laughs> or if she goes that way, he has to go there, like balancing a billiard cue on your finger. The billiard cue may take you wandering where you didn't know you were going to go. <laughs> and the girls know this quite well and can compel the man who carries them to go out into the muck of the rice fields, you see. And this is all part of the fun of the whole ritual operation. Well, it's nice to know where the self-correction lies in these cases and not always easy to tell. Okay, now the other, next thing is the levels. The levels are very clever. And in the history of science, again and again, the makers of explanatory theories get screwed up over the levels. A tragic figure was the Frenchman Lamarck who was the first person to propose a total evolutionary theory of biology. 
and did this in 1809. Uh, he was sort of a black sheep today because while Darwin believed the same things that Lamarck believed, Lamarck happened to be wrong and Darwin happened to be a big wheel and he was somehow able to overshadow Lamarck. I never quite understood how this happened. Anyway, what Lamarck believed, which turned out to be wrong, but which Darwin also believed, was that if you change yourself during your lifetime or are changed by environment, you are, we would say, tanned by the sun or trained by a school teacher to talk Latin or indeed trained to talk your own language by whatever trains you to talk your own language, which is always rather mysterious. Um, you cannot, in fact, pass on the effect of that training to your offspring. There is no inheritance from parent to child of the effects of environment and somatic change and learning and all those things. If you tan in the sun and brown your skin, there is in fact no passing on of the brownness of skin to the next generation. <coughs> And Lamarck based his theory of evolution on the idea there was such a passing on. And Darwin avoided the idea. Samuel Butler remarks about Darwin, if you read The Origin of Species, especially the later edition, the fifth edition, you will see Darwin behaving like a schoolboy with a pot of jam. Uh, secretly stealing a little bit of the inheritance of acquired characters from the jam pot every now and then, <laughs> but never quite acknowledging that he believes in it. And it's a roughly fair <coughs> description. He did finally come out with statements that he actually totally believed in. Uh, he got pushed by time. The geologists told him that evolutionary time was much shorter, than he had hoped it was, and in order to speed up evolution within his theoretical frame, he went to Lamarckian. And this was all very wicked. I was, my father was a geneticist, and I was brought up in a household in which the mention of the inheritance of acquired characteristics, as it was called, would lead to the coffee cups trembling on the table. <laughs> so, uh, now, what's wrong and, and why was this interesting and, and, and why does the world look, you see, as though this really happened? Because if you look at the animals and plants, it looks very much as though the effects of use and disuse and so on were passed on. Uh, it's a trick. And it's a trick of what is called technically the logical types. The difference between a class and its members <coughs> or between a class of classes and class. Uh, the truth of the matter is that you cannot get a message through from, say, your biceps to your ova or spermatozoa. As far as is known, there is no way of, uh, of sending such a message. Or if you did, the ova and spermatozoa wouldn't understand it if it was a new message. There are all sorts of difficulties. Uh, 
And that was the first criticism, that was the 19th century criticism. Well, nowadays, in the days of RNA and DNA, it's a little more conceivable that you might send such a message. Uh, but you see, there's this that if you could communicate from your skin, which is tanned by the sun, to your gametes, your spermatozoa ova, something about being brown or tanning or something, then your offspring would lose an option which you had. That is, you have an option either to be brown or to be pink, or whatever color quote, white men are. Uh, that option will be lost if you could pass on the brownness, the effect of sunshine, to your offspring. That option will be lost. So that if you had a Lamarckian world in which this sort of thing were passed on all the time, it would become a more and more rigid world by essentially the loss of self-corrective options. On the whole, it's a good thing to keep a lot of these things reversible so that you can adjust as the environment changes. If the environment is absolutely rigid and it's shipped and it's got into a new position and you now have to adjust the new position that's going to be there forever, it would perhaps pay to pass it on because genetic might be a more economical way of being brown using less circuits and things but that isn't always the case now what I want you to notice is that a population does tend to have Lamarckian features that is, you can have a selection among the gene pool of a population in which the ability to turn brown <coughs> will be given survival preference. You cannot affect your offspring, but your ability may affect your ability to have offspring. And in this way, the ability to turn brown may, may be selected for. And this is logically a different thing from being brown. This is the ability to turn brown. And this is quite a different story. And the last criterion which I would offer you for a mind as uh, something to use in explanation is that it have these levels of hierarchy that the ability to turn brown is differentiated from brownness and so forth and these levels are the things that scientists politicians and all sorts of people will not look at and appreciate and you get the same sort of problem in problems of learning and double binds which I used to talk about in the relation double binds to schizophrenia and so on all related to this matter of levels which is the last of the criteria of quote mind unquote Anybody got questions or I'm not entirely sure that I uh, understood the point about mind having to uh, have these characteristics of uh, the, the formality. Does that why that should be something strictly mental? Uh, for example, the uh, 
Well, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a sort of um, <coughs> political ploy in a certain sense. Uh, I want to talk about systems having these characteristics. And these are the necessary characteristics if you're going to compute, uh, if you're going to, you know, have <coughs> what in an ordinary sense are called mental characteristics. And we talk about thinking and talking and all that sort of stuff, purpose and so on. Now, my colleagues on my side of the limit, between the limit, within the limits of science, are very unwilling on the whole to deal with those matters. You know, they have a pretty strong 19th century feeling <coughs> that the chromosomes are going to push around the anatomy rather than give messages to the anatomy, for example. You were to be talking originally about language and this. Yeah. And it seemed to me that you could parse this particular thing here by saying, well, if we have something that's called a growing point, then that can transform itself into a stem, a leaf, a growing point, more stem, and a bud. Sure. And this sort of repeats itself and it produces that spark. Sure, sure. Now, yeah. that seems to me as a sort of... Uh, that growing point is uh, a different logical type of the stem and the and the leaf uh, and, and the bud. So, yes, yeah. But isn't that something that's sort of pretty kind of mechanical? Because I could grow something like that with a computer, I guess, and it wouldn't have. I to don't think a computer is very mechanical. Hmm. I mean, in the narrow sense of the word um, mechanical. A computer has an awful lot of feedbacks <coughs> in it, and you're going to make it recursive, make it into an Ouroboros that will bite its own tail, in order to make it do this. And by then, you see, I'm going to talk about mine. Now, uh, one of the things that happens, we, we used to argue with uh, the argument has sort of disappeared rapidly, as to whether, whether computers could think. And there are two replies to that question, really. Uh, one reply is, if you are dealing simply with an input of one sort of data, go to go to go to, it works inside, and now it outputs something, that I shall not regard as thinking, because I regard that as, in a sense, a lineal operation, in spite of feedbacks maybe inside the box. Right? On the other hand, a computer in the hands of a human being uh, living in an environment such that the human being collects data from the environment and feeds them to the computer and then is altered in his behavior when he treats with the environment. That whole system of environment, computer, and man, I will say, thinks. Right? Um, I will not say that the governor of a steam engine thinks, but I will say that the whole system of steam engine with governor does in a sense think, or oh, steam engine plus variable load plus governor in a sense thinks. And there's a, a very deep <coughs> and almost ethical split, certainly a deep split in, in good taste and perhaps a split in ethics, which is related always to good taste, <coughs> um, which has occurred in cybernetics, I suppose in the 50s, really. The whole build-up of the theory was, you know, in the late 40s, really, in the very early 50s. And by the late 50s, you get a split in which the subject of conversation changes from being these are pieces of something or other that act upon each other and there's an energy supply coming in somewhere 
and these bits act in some sort of circuit, and the properties of that circuit are to me the subject matter of cybernetics. Uh, what happens is you get that thing cut by an imaginary line and now you have uh, input-output relations from this box vis-a-vis -vis this environment, whatever it is, and you say this box is adaptive or is clever or is something or other and acts upon this environment in certain ways and so on. And this is, as Poison says, any ego, any human being, and you're back, you see, to where you were before you ever really thought about circuits, and you've got this uh, narrow, appetitive, purposive thing going around as a monster in the universe, enclosed by an imaginary line, which I've drawn thicker than anything else on the picture. That is the way in which cybernetics was assimilated into 19th century scientific thinking, who thinks a machine, you know, as a one-way lineal thing and not as a circuit structure. <coughs> right? Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, um, once you've postulated this mind, have you given it much thought in terms of some of the work that Stan's been doing? For instance, you talked about acquired potentials. And one of the things that he seems to have pointed out, or he has pointed out, that people are able to have embryonic experiences, recall ancestral experiences, and so on. Do you see that as some kind of accumulative potential over time, or? Uh, I would not use the word potential, well, except as a... <coughs> potential is a dangerous word because it suggests um, voltage, you know. Um, and in general, the energy relations are not such as would be appropriately metaphorized. You <coughs> describe the metaphors of voltage. But, all right, uh, what do I say about the very deep patterns which human beings obviously acquire in their mental life. Uh, first of all, let me point out that the business of learning in the widest sense is hierarchic. Uh, that is, if you imagine the uh, experimental dog in a Pavlov lab, learns to salivate when he hears a buzzer, yes, whatever it is, and receives then a reward of meat powder, whatever. And we say he learned to salivate. And this is the sense, more or less, in which the word learning tends to be used in psych labs. But obviously even this dog in this very rudimentary sort of diagrammatic position is learning something more, namely the structure of the Pavlovian context, which is approximately the structure of the world of an astrologer. That you cannot, you know, influence the stars, but you can look at the stars for signs of when reinforcement is coming. Now, in the American psych labs, you can influence the stars. When the buzzer uh, squawks, you're supposed to do something, press a bar, something correct, and if you do the correct thing, you will get the reinforcement. This is a different sort of philosophy of life. You can think of the world as made up of certain sorts of fatalism, or you can think of the world as made up of certain sorts of opportunity, to use the local word. And these are different ways of looking at things. Uh, there are an enormous number of such ways. The psychologists who specialize in investigating two or three of them. 
the Pavlovian way, the instrumental way, the instrumental avoidance is a little different. 